Welcome to today's webinar, The Bird-Friendly and Biophilic City, Integrating Safe Natural Habitats into Urban Design and Planning, hosted by the Maryland Department of Planning in association with the Smart Growth Network. My name is Michael Bayer. I'm the Manager of Infrastructure and Development at the Maryland Department of Planning and Project Manager for the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse. The Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse is a project of the Smart Growth, growth Network, supported by the US EPA's Office of Community Revitalization and managed by the Maryland Department of Planning. In addition to hosting webinars, the Smart Growth Information Clearinghouse has a website, smartgrowth.org, that provides current information on effective growth, development, and preservation practices. The website provides news and information about events, funding opportunities, awards, and resources to help local decision makers foster healthy, resilient, and economically vibrant communities. The Clearinghouse is the virtual home of the Smart Growth Network, a nationally recognized coalition of leadership organizations that have formally endorsed the principles of smart growth. This webinar is one in a series of webinars produced by the Maryland Department of Planning on smart growth and planning topics available for viewing at smartgrowth.org. We are recording this webinar and we'll be posting it on our website under the webinar archives tab. We encourage you to visit the website and to subscribe to our e-newsletter for smart growth and planning news and to learn about our upcoming webinars. You can also find out about planning initiatives, planning tools, and educational opportunities in Maryland by visiting the Maryland Department of Planning's website at planning.maryland.gov. The views expressed by the speaker in this webinar are those of the speaker and not necessarily of the Maryland Department of Planning or the state of Maryland. Viewers of this live event are eligible to receive one and a half CM credits from the American Planning Association and 1.5 CNUA CEU self-reported credits from the Congress for the New Urbanism. To log your AICP credits, visit the American Planning Association's website at planning.org, log into your account, and search for the name of today's event, which is the Bird-Friendly and Biophilic City, Integrating Safe and Natural Habitats into Urban Design and Planning. You can also search for event number 920-8707. I would also like to acknowledge our partner today, Island Press, and their partnerships manager, Jen Hawes. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and create solutions to its complex problems. So to get started today, our speaker is Timothy Beatley. Tim Beatley is the Teresa Heinz Professor of Sustainable Communities at the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia, where he has taught for more than 25 years. His primary teaching and research interests are in environmental planning and policy with special emphasis on coastal and natural hazards planning, envir environmental values and ethics, and biodiversity conservation. He has published extensively in this area, including ethical land use, habitat conservation planning, endangered species and urban growth, natural hazard mitigation, and an introduction to coastal zone management. In recent years, much of his research and writing has been focused on the subject of sustainable communities and creative strategies by which cities and towns can reduce their ecological footprints while at the same time becoming more livable and equitable places. Following his presentation, Tim will answer as many questions as time permits. You can submit a question anytime by using the questions tool in the control panel located on the right side of your screen. And now, before we actually turn it over to Tim, we're going to launch a couple polls so we can get a sense of who's in the audience today. So the first one is just a simple one. Where do you live or work? Let's give your five options here. If you have trouble responding, you need, may need to exit from full screen mode. And we'll give everybody a couple seconds to respond. Those of you who've been on other webinars probably have answered this question before. It's always interesting to see who's with us today. It looks like we have a pretty good distribution. We'll show that to you momentarily. Give everybody a chance to respond. So today, uh, about 37% are in the mid-Atlantic mid and Northeast. 21% are in the West, and this is self-described, obviously, self-defined. 15% in the South, 13% uh, in the Midwest, and we actually have 14% international today. I will have one more poll question for everybody. 
and this is simply what is your profession and you can see the options there again you can have an opportunity to respond in the full by taking the full screen mode off it's always interesting to see who's with us today it does vary a bit depending on the topic We'll keep it open for maybe another 30 seconds or so. So thanks for participating. This is a question that many of our panelists ask before we get started and as we get prepped for this. And those who are responding other may want to just put a comment in the questions tab so we can see that. Uh, 50 6% planners, 31% other, 9% landscape architect, 3% architect, and 1% real estate. So with that, we're going to go ahead and turn it over to Tim. Welcome, Tim. Uh, hello. Um, hope everybody is well. Great to see you. I'm going to go ahead and pull up my slides. So uh, Michael and John, it sounds like I don't need to do anything else, right, except uh, start to show. Um, let's see where I go. Do the to the beginning and hopefully it'll hmm, let's see here. Show screen. Uh, uh, let's see. Is that can you see anything at this point? It's not up yet. Oh, here it goes. Sorry. Um well great to to, to at least virtually see uh, or know that you're there. So many folks interested in this in this topic. So um, hopefully you have the slides in front of you now. Uh oh, what happened? Um, can you see the slides, everybody? Yeah, it's still not up. Still not. Ah, I have actually not yet. Hmm. All right, I think I'm not doing something right to share here. Um, it says people can see the screen, and I'm hitting the beginning of the slideshow, and it's turning away and coming up. How about now? It's, uh, it's up. It's up now. Fantastic. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, anyway, great great to, to see so much interest in this. And so I'm going to do, in the time that I have, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to uh, start by talking about the concept of biophilic cities and what that's all about and, and tell you uh, about this global network uh, of cities. And then that frames well, I think, uh, the second part, which is more specifically about um, bird-friendly uh, cities and bird-friendly design, which I really think of as being uh, embedded in and part of what a biophilic city um, is. Well, we've already done the short survey of who you are. Wonderful to see that that distribution and its planners and, and architects as well and, and some other folks, landscape architects. It's a, a great mix. Um, so to begin, I am an urban planner, so um, we are very concerned about how we can design and plan the next generation of cities. We, we believe that they really need to be dense and, and compact uh, for a lot of reasons. If we're going to uh, address climate change, we're going to create conditions for walking and bicycling and, and so on. Uh, but that raises the question, can these compact and dense cities also be places of, of nature? And there's a question mark on the slide. Um, take that question mark away. We very much argue that, that in fact, you can have nature and have to have nature. So um, the word biophilia, many of you are undoubtedly already comfortable with that idea. Um, we have to give a lot of credit to E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson at Harvard. He wasn't the first person to use this word, but he's really the one who's coined it in the way that we think of it. This idea that we are hardwired, that we have this innate uh, connection with, with nature, that we've co-evolved with the natural world. So to be uh, truly happy and healthy and to lead uh, meaningful lives, we have to, to have that connection with uh, nature. It's not something optional. And we believe that it has to be around us everywhere uh, where we're spending most of our time, uh, where we're living, where we're working. It can't just be something that you get once or twice a year on a vacation. So in around 2010 or so, we started something called the Biophilic Cities Project here at UVA. Uh, we had uh, funding from the Summit Foundation, Washington, D.C.-based foundation. And it started really as a research project. We were trying to kind of understand what are the the leading cities 
around the world that were successfully incorporating nature, putting nature at the center of their uh, design and planning. And at the end of that couple of years of, of uh, research, we brought everybody, representatives of the 10 cities that we were looking at, uh, to Charlottesville. We had a four-day conference at the end of that, actually, uh, almost a spontaneous um, desire to keep the group going. And from that emerged the launching of this global network of, of cities. Um, we could spend a, a lot of our time just talking about the evidence. But I, I think most of you probably have followed this. And, and for me, it's at a very visceral level. These are things that are demonstrated in our, our daily lives. What is it that we that gives us solace? What is it that we enjoy? What is it that we're drawn to? And um, it's not always nature, but nature seems to have a special power. So think about flowers and, and trees and, and living things uh, like butterflies and, and birds, of course, we'll talk about later, things like water. And there's an awful lot of evidence uh, that has emerged, especially over the last five to 10 years, about the benefits, the value that we get from being in and around nature. Many of you have heard about the forest bathing work coming out of Japan, the idea that after a, a walk in a forest um, that our stress hormone levels go down, that that walk will give us a boost to our uh, immune uh, system. And the Japanese are so convinced that they've established a network of forest bathing stations. And the idea of forest bathing has made its way, of course, to the US as well. Um, Exactly why uh, we have this uh, reaction to nature is still something being discussed and explored. Uh, there is a, an emerging science of biophilia. Uh, some of it has to do with fractals, um, the, the lower right image, the idea of self-repeating shapes and forms in nature, that, that leaf of a tree that, that is a miniature of the bow, which is a miniature of the larger tree, uh, here's a quote from Richard Taylor, the chair of the physics department at the University of Oregon, who's been doing a lot of the work in this area. And he believes that we have uh, evolved a, a visual system, essentially, that effortlessly processes fractals in nature. So um, it's not surprising that we are comfortable and, and uh, ha happiest and calmest when we are in nature, watching nature, listening to nature. The image on the left, um, is about birds, really interesting uh, project in the UK using bird song as a way to gauge hearing loss. Um, but it reminds me to say that we know that bird, bird song, uh, a lot of evidence that bird song has these same kinds of effects that helps to calm us, uh, helps to, to improve our cognitive functioning. It's a strong mental health benefits from having a bird song, from hearing bird song. And the, um, a, a lot of uh, projects and, and initiatives to actually bring birdsong into interiors of, of buildings in places like hospitals where uh, birdsong is being played uh, at especially stressful times when, uh, when kids are going into surgery or about to be inoculated. So uh, there is a science uh, involved in, in this. Still lots of things we, we don't know. And a lot of the evidence is, is, is more associational than causal. Um, but it is amazing and, and, and quite impressive to see the body of work and almost every week some, something new, a new a study. And, and we tried to develop a slide for a healthcare conference that would summarize uh, these benefits of nature. And it's hard to do it. Um, this was my attempt at it. But uh, so, so here are all these things that are associated with the presence of nature, lower depression, lower anxiety lower levels of stress, improved mood, uh, increased physical activity. We know that that, uh, that greener uh, tree-lined um, streets and neighborhoods uh, propel us outside, lower crime rates even. There's evidence now that in the presence of nature, we're more likely to be generous, we're more likely to be cooperative, more likely to be creative. Uh, so for me, it uh, one word that sort of captures a lot of this is the concept of flourishing. So it is about uh, your mood and about uh, pleasurable sights and sounds, but it's also about meaningful lives. And so this is a really essential thing that we need to uh, put at the center of our design and planning. Again, it can't be something optional. It's absolutely essential. 
And I think actually, if there's any silver lining from the pandemic and uh, much of the world being in lockdown is how we have rediscovered nature. And we uh, appreciate now perhaps more than we ever did before um, the therapeutic value of nature. It is a balm, it is a solve, it is a saving grace. And we've been trying to capture in our network uh, the stories of how cities are responding in real time, uh, trying to find creative ways to maximize the numbers of people who can enjoy that, that that nature. By the way, uh, birds are, I think, are a really big part of the story. And um, you know, in a in a time when it, nothing seems normal, uh, birds are still migrating, um, and we still hear birds. There's a it's a there's a, a normalcy or a constancy to that that's very reassuring or has been very reassuring for a lot of us. So the image on the left is actually Forest Park in Portland, one of our partner cities, and they just as an example have. Uh, designed these these one-way loops to try to maximize the um, number of people that can enjoy that wonderful park and unprecedented levels of interest and and um, and you know just wanting to visit places like that. So um, you know lots of other reasons to incorporate nature, of course, and they many services provided by nature um, ecosystem services anything, virtually anything you can do to make a city more natureful, more biophilic, will also make it more uh, resilient, whether that's uh, green rooftops or a tree planting. Um, these are images from Rotterdam, where nature plays a big role in the management of water. So bio, biophilic design and planning go hand in hand uh, with resilient uh, uh, cities. But what is a biophilic city? A little bit more detail. and I should say you know that that biophilic cities is a uh, it is an idea it, it is a vision really for future cities um, but it is also a global movement and and as I'll talk about more in a minute it is a network of global cities um, biophilic cities are cities that connect us to nature and so they can uh, we've seen all the value that we get from that that contact that that daily or hourly connection to nature it also helps to connect humans to each other. We have a lot of evidence about that. It is uh, all these things that we find in cities, parks and gardens and trees. It's it's uh, all those things, but all the spaces uh, between and beyond. So to paraphrase John Gale, it's the life between and beyond the, the buildings, right? So it's everything from the rooftop uh, all the way out to the region or the bioregion and all of the scales uh, in, in between. It is a, a vision that emphasizes, again, nature connections, but also human connections, uh, a, a vision that recognizes the increasingly important role that cities have to play in uh, global conservation and conservation of the natural world and in addressing the, the trends, uh, really alarming trends of the global loss of biodiversity. We, our vision of, of a biophilic city is one where we share that space with uh, lots of other forms of life. And that actually raises uh, the duty or the obligation, the ethical dimension of sharing, of coexisting, actively coexisting uh, with other forms of life, including birds. So for many of the cities in our network, they're pushing the envelope. They are um, moving quickly in the direction of this new new vision. This is an image from Singapore. Singapore's been a, a partner city from the very beginning. Uh, I'm sure many of you know the story. For, for a long time, they referred to themselves as a garden city. Um, more recently, they really, they have changed their motto to city in a garden, which seems like a small change, but it's quite profound. The idea that you don't just have a city with some uh, forms of nature that you that you visit, like a park or a garden uh, or a forest, but rather you see the city itself as a garden, a forest, um, a park. And so uh, recently, and in part because of the the lockdown there, the city has uh, changed their motto. Actually, moving in the direction of calling themselves a, a city and nature. And partly a result of our relationship with them, I think they uh, frequently call themselves a biophilic city in nature now, which seems redundant, but we, we like that redundancy. 
this is an image of the Park Royal uh, Hotel, which gives you a, a little bit of a flavor uh, for how this uh, city achieves this immersive nature vision. Part of it is about the planning system and, and codes that they have there. There's something called the landscape replacement policy, which requires new buildings to replace at least one-to-one -one the nature lost at ground level uh, with vertical nature. In the case of this building, it's, it's uh, more than two-to-one, and it's uh, green rooftops and sky gardens and, and hanging, hanging greenery, uh, all the things that you could imagine uh, would be part of, a, part of a biophilic building. But then beginning to see the city, um, a little bit more than beginning to see it in, in Singapore, a, a city of all the connections between these green elements and a more holistic um, green uh, city. Um, I've made this point already, but uh, we're frequently calling this vision, referring to it as a whole of city approach. Again, rooftop um, room all the way to region or bioregion. This is a map of Helsinki's green spaces network. You can move from a dense uh, center city location all the way out to old growth forests at the edge of that, that city. Um, it is a continuum in our cities between indoor and outdoor. We think of a biophilic city as a city that does everything it can to propel residents outside. Um, and But we also recognize the reality that more than 90% of our typical day, um, even before the pandemic, was spent indoors. So partly this agenda is about bringing nature inside um, as much as we possibly can and overcoming the barriers that exist between the indoor and the outdoor world. It's also, again, a vision of uh, rethinking those discrete parts of nature that we find in cities and, and, and connecting them and seeing that city again as uh, a, a network, as a, a, an ecosystem, as a set of pathways, connections, and ecosystems, as the slide suggests. Uh, Pittsburgh has been a partner city for uh, a long time now, and uh, this is just an image that makes the point that our vision of nature is uh, that the, the city has nature all around it, and it it, it can be found in, in lots of ways, in lots of places, and it may be that eco rooftop, it may be the forest canopy and the trees in that city, and P Pittsburgh is understandably proud of its 42% tree canopy coverage. It's also parks. Um, Pittsburgh has a brand new large park. Um, it's quite proud of, but it's also the water, and it's also things like the bridge you see here that might be a nesting spot for a peregrine falcon. So nature is uh, all, all around us, and we're already sharing uh, a lot of our space with other forms of life. So there is a protocol for joining, uh, requirements for joining. Um, if I forget to say this, please, everybody, take a look at our webpage, biophilicities.org. Um, and so if you are living in a city that you think might like to be part of, formally part of our, our uh, network as a partner city, um, there you can find the application um, materials, we require a narrative that, that uh, asks how, how a city is already biophilic and also how it, what it will be aspiring to in the future. Uh, we require a certain number of metrics, a uh, certain number of indicators from, from certain categories, and we also require a city council adopted resolution or proclamation. Um, this is me uh, at a ceremony giving, awarding the certificate to Mayor Peduto. In, uh, in Pittsburgh, and usually there's a, a celebratory uh, event, and we had a wonderful event at the Phipps Conservatory uh, in, in Pittsburgh. And we also get wonderful press usually uh, when that event happens. So at the moment we have uh, 42 cities, sorry, 24, not 42, 24 cities officially in the network. Um, and I think this is a reasonably up-to-date map, uh, but we also have uh, probably three or 4,000 individual members of the network, and you can go to the webpage and just um, uh, by signing a pledge, uh, add your name and, and become part of the, the network as an individual, and then we have several hundred uh, organizations that are also uh, part of the, the, the network. Uh, as I say, there are um, metrics that we require each partner city to uh, adopt, and this slide is partly meant to um, make the point that it isn't just the presence or absence of nature that defines a biophilic city. You can have a wonderfully natureful city, 
Um, but if the residents of that city don't care about that nature, are not engaged in it, um, then that's not very biophilic. So it is a, a lot of other things, biophilic behaviors, patterns, practices, lifestyles, attitudes, biophilic institutions and governance, how committed is that local government to investing in that nature, investing in the restoration, the protection, restoration, uh, designing in of that, that nature. These are all really important uh, additional elements in what makes a biophilic city. So, so you can tell it's sort of a larger, longer conversation than I have uh, today uh, in, the time, in the time that I have. Um, it is really important to make the point that we believe strongly in the idea of just biophilia, the idea of social justice, that we know that there, uh, there is a, an unfair and unjust distribution of nature in cities around the U.S. and around the world. And our vision is one of a just and inclusive nature. And uh, these are images actually from Kali Park uh, in Portland. We have a, a five-minute film, by the way. We have made a number of short documentary films about many of the things I'm talking about today. And I'd love for you to go find the film page on biophilicscities.org and watch uh, some of those films. Oops. So Collie Park is a wonderful story. It's a, a former landfill that uh, has been converted to a, a lovely park, but it wasn't just a, a park designed from on high from the parks department. It was uh, designed by the neighborhood. And this is a, uh, a, a neighborhood of color um, that did not have a park um, like this. And, uh, and a wonderful story of, of engagement and uh, for example, the lower left image is a raised bed gardens actually designed by kids in the neighborhood. So yeah, it's a really wonderful example of how important those parks are and how important it is to in, in, in engage uh, the communities around them in the actual design of those places. Um, the metrics that cities adopt in our network certainly uh, convey the sense of uh, overcoming Historic uh, racism, systemic racism. This, these are images from from Richmond, where the where you can look at the old redlining maps from the 1930s, and they line up um, well with um, places that don't have very very uh, high levels of forest canopy, for example. And so, in the new Richmond plan uh, called Richmond 300, they have included some impressive nature targets. Richmond is now in our network as well including that every resident uh, sh should be within a 10 minute walk of a park and, and minimum pre-canopy uh, goals for all neighborhoods um, and investments in things like trees according to vulnerability under their heat vulnerability index. So uh, nature can be part of the healing process, part of the way of rectifying uh, the injustices that have, been, uh, uh, that have occurred in many of our cities. So uh, a just biophilia is an important part uh, of this uh, as well. Um, so many things that our cities are doing there on our webpage, there uh, is a, a page for each of the 24 cities, um, 24 partner cities. So if you see anything that looks of interest to you, I'm gonna have a few more slides and we'll get into a little bit more detail, but um, there's a, a lot more on the on the web page if you if you want to uh, look for it. So the nature that we find in our biophilic cities network is of many different kinds, right? And I've already made the point about room and rooftop. Um, and we believe that a biophilic city is a city with lots of biophilic buildings, and really every a home, uh, every tower, every uh, office ought to incorporate nature. This is a, a wonderful uh, new project from uh, Toronto called Designers Walk. It's a, a couple of hundred, several hundred uh, trees and a, essentially a vertical uh, forest and a, a, a lot of really wonderful innovations like designing the, the planting space into the, the the building itself into the structure, uh, into the floor plates. And uh, they like to talk about this being a plug, plug and play um, and creating wonderful terraced, green terraced, uh, bringing nature in inside the individual units, but also creating uh, nature for the neighborhood um, as well. 
we're very uh, concerned about how you move through a city. So our cities have been wonderful, uh, have wonderful trail and pathway uh, networks. This is again the example of Singapore. Singapore has a, a 300 kilometer network of park connectors, and you see some of them here. Some of them bring you through the tree canopy in, in that city state. Um, and other in other uh, cities like San Francisco, it is a, it is a wonderful trail uh, network and and two uh, parallel bay trail networks that add up to a thousand acres or thousand miles rather. Um, it is the nature in a sidewalk and in this again the spaces around where we live and work. This these are images from San Francisco um, where they have thanks to the good work of this person Jane Martin created a special sidewalk landscape permit which allows residents to take up pavement and plant uh, these wonderful gardens and these are all images of his, around her uh, where she lives in her in her neighborhood but there have now been 2,000 more than 2,000 of these sidewalk landscape permits um, issued. Um, San Francisco very famous for its parklets but it has a lot of other wonderful programs for repurposing small spaces for nature uh, it has a wonderful uh, program called Street Parks uh, that runs out of the Public Works Department. It's essentially allowing neighborhoods to convert the median strips uh, between roads into small parks and gathering spaces, and a uh, really wonderful story there. Fremantle in Western Austra Australia, so far our only Australian city to officially join, a wonderful program there for encouraging the planting of, of, of native plants, native vegetation, particularly in the verges, these spaces between a road and a sidewalk, you see one in the image here. Um, a lot of our cities are rewilding the spaces in cities in, 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 in um, very creative ways. This is Vittoria Gestez, the capital of the Basque country, um, and they are famous for their green ring that circles this very compact walkable city. Now they're bringing the green ring into the interior of the city, and this is one of their first projects, basically lighting a stream, a small river that was in a pipe underground, bringing it back to the surface and, and making it uh, a part of this dense uh, neighborhood. Um, a wonderful story from Perth, Western Australia, uh, a rewilding story of uh, taking a sterile, uh, high, high uh, energy, chlorinated uh, water feature in the center of the city and converting it into a wonderful biodiverse native wetland. Um, we have about a five or six minute film about this urban wetland story um, on the webpage and love for you to, to, to look at that as well. And this is actually creating um, habitat in the middle of the city for birds and other critters. Um, this is Portland, Oregon, and they have been, of course, been building, uh, installing green streets, these sort of linear um, stormwater features that bring, that, that address the resilience challenges of the city uh, when it comes to stormwater, but also bringing new nature in, into, into neighborhoods. I'm going pretty fast here, and, and sorry for that. I, I'm, I've got probably too many slides for the time that we have, but uh, in questions on later, I'm happy to back up and uh, spend more time on any particular uh, example or, or story. So I've made the point that uh, our cities are uh, increasingly understanding um, their understanding themselves as as ecosystems and and as ecological networks and and spaces that we're sharing with many other forms of life. Edmonton, Canada is a wonderful example of a planning system uh, organized around this idea of ecological networks and, and the movement of other forms of life and co-occupying spaces with other forms of life. So they've built now their 27th wildlife passage that allows uh, animals to move through that city, including coyotes, um, and their um, underpasses and overpasses and, and uh, ways of, uh, again, understanding how that city can be, um, uh, you know, pathways and corridors for, for many other forms of, of life. Uh, Austin, Texas is now in the network. Many of you know the story of the million and a half Mexican free-tailed bats that, that took up uh, summer residence under the Congress Avenue Bridge. It was a surprise. Um, but it led, it's a longer story, um, eventually a biophilic story that the city appreciates and loves these bats and hundreds of people 
uh, come to the bridge as the sun goes down uh, uh, during the summer months to watch the emergence of these of these bats. A really wonderful story. Puerto Dabat uh, is a a city in Costa Rica, uh, also a partner city. Wonderful story there of their uh, efforts to install um, pollinator gardens throughout the city. What they call a uh, sweet city. Um, and um, side sweet sidewalks, uh, uh, native plants, um, really everywhere in the city and parks, but also creating these this idea of bio corridors, so butterflies and birds can can in fact move through uh, the city. This is a Guardian story in the Guardian from earlier in the year uh, that talks about the mayor who started this program, and he likes to refer to bees, birds plants and trees as being citizens of the city, which I think is a really wonderful way and uh, brings kind of biological inclusiveness in a really dramatic fashion. So we have a lot of stories. Um, and this is another film on the webpage about a, a nonprofit called Gotham Green in New York City uh, that shows the return, the story of the return of um, humpback whales to the waters of New York and, and dolphins as well. Um, and it, it's partly an example of how uh, we need to be uh, reconnecting to the marine uh, marine life uh, around us in cities like, like New York. Wellington, New Zealand, another partner city, um, they have a wonderful uh, protected land, land conservation system around green belts, terrestrial system, Increasingly, they are talking about blue belts uh, to connect with the green belts. Um, that means the, all the waters around the city, uh, including its harbor. Um, and that's a trend that we're seeing in many of our, our cities. Vishakhapatnam is a, a, a new city in the network, our first Indian city. A wonderful story, actually, of how stray dogs have uh, been trained to be protective of the uh, olive ridley sea turtles um, that nest on the shore of, of this uh, city, right on the bay of, of Bengal. So um, a wonderful story there, again, of a, a kind of biologically inclusive uh, city. So I'm going to transition now in a second. There, there are lots of things, again, on the web page, lots of resources. A lot of what we have done with the network is share uh, good practice and, and stories. I mentioned the films. We also have an online journal called Biophilic Cities. You can find that. These are some of the, the covers from, from recent editions, and I've already mentioned the, the films. Okay, uh, now on the time left, uh, I want to talk about, just give you a little bit of a flavor for some of the stories that are told in the new book, in a bird friendly uh, city. And uh, let's see, John and or Michael, um, I don't know if we have time to take the poll. Uh, can we do that? We have a few questions yes. we'd like to ask you. Yes, in fact, it's already on the screen. Uh, the question is, how important are birds been to you during the pandemic? Yeah, you won't be able to see it, Tim, unless you look at okay. the audience view in the control panel. So we'll okay. give folks some few seconds to respond. Well, Great. And if you're having trouble responding, you can exit from full screen mode. Give them maybe another 20 seconds or so, Tim. Okay. Okay. So the response is here, uh, extremely important and very important. Both got 34%. 25% somewhat important and only 7% not very important. Okay. And I can't remember, we have more than one question, right? Or... Yeah. Yeah, the second question is now up on the screen. Okay. In what ways have you engaged with or experienced birds? Listening to them, watching through windows, feeding them, the bird feeder, bird watching walks in the neighborhood and other ways. So we'll give some time to respond to that as well. And the number of people are, and that's a, a multiple response. You can click on all of them if you want, so all of the relevant ones.
more seconds here. People are responding. We can see them coming in. So the response is almost in the order that they're listed. 86% uh, watching through windows, 82% listening, 50% uh, bird watching walk, 45% feeding, and 29% other ways. Okay. Very good. Um, okay. Well, I will I will continue. That's great to to see. And so, can you see uh, folks see my screen again, Michael? Or John? Yes, you're good. Go ahead. You're, you're good. Okay. Um. So I'm gonna again give you a quick sense of the 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 things covered in the books in the book and some of the stories. Uh, of how cities are becoming more um, bird friendly. And I, I just want to start, this is um, a, a local artist here in Charlottesville, Cynthia Burke, who does these uh, wonderful and unusual um, paintings of, of animals. And uh, for me, it is about this whole, maybe whole period of the pandemic, and it sounds like maybe many in the audience as well, uh, have had a, a, a renewed uh, enjoyment. Of, of birds and they are, um, you know, I don't know about the halo, but I love the way that she has depicted these um, birds. Birds are for me, they are superheroes. They're, they're angels, um, you know, they're, they're saviors um, in a time of, of COVID. And they're you know, not, not necessarily, I don't want to anthropomorphize uh, uh, birds, but uh, but they are uh, as close a thing to real angels as we have in in the world, right? And they bring us joy and and happiness and hope and all all of these things that I think we especially need um, uh, today. And they make our communities better, right? They make our lives fuller. And um, I am frequently uh, talking about birdsong and the importance of bird song. And this is one of the most important sounds for me. In the spring, uh, the wood thrush, it is a remarkable song. It takes me immediately back to my childhood. It embeds me in, in place, and it, and it makes me happy when I, when I hear it. White-throated sparrows, um, so the thrush are not here any longer, but we have a lot of white-throated sparrows right now in my neighborhood and they're doing this wonderful uh, wonderful sound. Um, so it's partly uh, about sharing the world with other forms of life. It's partly an antidote to loneliness. And, and um, I, I think it's not surprising that we've sought the solace of watching and listening to birds during a time of a pandemic. Sound or or voice. I think increasingly we have to recognize the that you know the that we are in fact um, that, that what we're hearing is a living creature um, that we're sharing this world uh, with. And it's a wonderful little quote from from um, an ethicist, uh, cardinal ethicist uh, from Australia, uh, Val Plum, Plumwood. So we know, I think most of you know that uh, birds are not doing so well. We had the very shocking uh, uh, study. Uh, Ken Rosenberg and his colleagues uh, last fall uh, about this time that discovered that there are about um, 3 billion missing birds compared to the number in 1970, a relatively short period uh, of time. Uh, really shocking. Um, I won't read this entire quote, but uh, you know, 30 percent of bird abundance that we saw in 1970. It is a, a combination of many different things. Obviously, climate change is a, a major culprit, but it's it's deforestation and habitat loss and and a lot of things, uh, increasing pesticide use, decline in, in flying insects, a lot of things uh, at work. But a lot of things have directly to do with how we plan and design cities, right? And um, it is here where I want to spend a little bit of time. Um, part, partly uh, the stories uh, from cities that I write about are about trying to just you know, grapple with the, the magnitude of, of the problem. 
Um, and I'm a big fan of, uh, of an organization in Toronto called FLAP, uh, which stands for Fatal Flight Awareness Program, um, begun by a guy named Michael Mazur. And these are uh, volunteers in one of the first places where they actually went around uh, during peak migration times uh, to, to, to look for dead and, and injured birds. Um, and, and, you know, it's a, a, a step that we need to take to understand how many birds and how severe and serious, uh, a serious danger uh, buildings are, and especially windows. Um, so birds don't do very well understanding that windows as, as barriers, and they don't see them, and they, what they see um, is the reflection of a tree or um, a cloud. And, uh, and the strikes uh, are often fatal. Uh, upwards of a billion uh, um, birds are killed um, each year in that, in that way. So they do this, uh, this powerful thing of collecting the birds from, that, from each season and then displaying them, uh, usually at the Royal Ontario Museum. And they display them in a very arresting kind of way. And it sometimes gets the front page of the paper. And that's a really important step for us in understanding that um, the things that we build and design in cities um, harm other forms of life, birds in particular. There are many things we can do about that, right? Uh, Bird-friendly uh, glass, uh, fritted glass, glass that, uh, that has, has patterns um, or a UV, a UV pattern that allows birds to see that glass as uh, a barrier or, or netting or other you know, a variety of different um, uh, um, bird safe facade design ideas. The so fritted glass is, uh, has emerged as the most important thing. This is the Jacob Javits uh, Center in New York City, complete retrofit uh, with, with um, bird friendly fritted glass and with a remarkable reduction in bird mortality as a result. And by the way, a more energy efficient building. So it's helping us to uh, reduce our, our greenhouse gas emissions as well. And by the way, there's a green roof installed on the roof on the top, which uh, is habitat uh, for nesting birds uh, in, in the city, a seven acre green roof is what some of the fritting looks like on the glass. Um, many examples to point to and are discussed in the book, the Frick Environmental Center in our uh, partner city of Pittsburgh is a wonderful example actually of how you can retrofit. Um, these are paracords um, that, that uh, drape down from the top and they are on the exterior of the window and it creates just enough visibility of that barrier uh, for, for birds. And this was a really interesting do-it-yourself project of a, a, um, a high school students actually that that um, that designed and and bought the materials and actually uh, installed them. Um, but it's in new buildings as well. This is the Ken, Candida building uh, on the campus of, of Georgia Tech. It is a certified living building, so it's net zero energy, net zero water. Um, part of what we need to be doing, of course, is, is radically reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. If we're concerned about birds, climate, we need to be addressing climate change. So from a mitigation point of view, this building is wonderful, but it also incorporates uh, bird-friendly glass. Uh, so it is helpful in that way uh, also. I'm going pretty fast, but happy to circle back. Um, so that was an Atlanta building, and uh, we actually have a five or six minute film uh, about Atlanta as a bird-friendly city with some discussion of bird-friendly buildings in the city. This is another um, dramatic recent example, the Interface Carpet Headquarters building, or what they call Base Camp, um, has a, a pretty dramatic visual feature, which is 307 panels of glass wrapped by a semi-transparent polyester sheath which basically depicts a forest and it creates dappled light inside and, and it's a wonderful biophilic uh, device for, for the people who are, who are uh, in, working in the building, but it also uh, allows for birds to see that glass. So uh, we have many positive examples. Um, these are all buildings that are discussed and profiled in the book, the Aqua Tower, Genie Gang's wonderful design here that has uh, fritted glass, but also these, um, these wavy terraces or balconies. And it's a wonderful building and the birds understand the barriers. 
Uh, Michael Mazur of FLAP is frequently asking the question, uh, you know, can't, can't we make more interesting buildings, interesting designs um, when we make them bird friendly? And the answer is definitely yes, he, he believes so and argues strongly. Um, this is a new building at, at, the, at Ryerson University, the new student center, which um, has this textured facade um, that can be seen by birds, but also creates this really wonderfully interesting uh, building. So I think one point is that we can be more creative from a design point of view, um, and and you know, but also uh, a, a really important result is is uh, making these buildings bird safe. What else do we need to do? We really need to up our game when it comes to protecting and restoring uh, natural habitat in and around. Uh, uh, cities. And so on the right is the map of the wonderful ravine system, these forested ravines that that um, run through uh, the city of Toronto. Toronto has a new uh, ravine strategy, um, I've just discussed in, in the book. These are corridors for birds. On the left is Kate Kelly, uh, who had a hand in stopping a highway project in Western Australia, also discussed in the book. That highway would have involved the destruction of uh, some some ancient wetlands um, and Banksia hardwood forest that you see behind her. And they stopped uh, the the forest. They stopped rather the highway and they protected the forest. It's a wonderful story. Um, we have a little film about that uh, as as well. And that forest uh, was sacred land for the Aboriginal uh, community uh, as well for the Noongar. Uh, people who, inha who have inhabited this landscape for 60,000 years. And part of the lesson of that story is, is listening to their uh, voices. And so um, an interview with Noel Manup, who's a Noongar elder, which is included in the book. And he talks about how uh, their, uh, their society is very, has a totemic focus. So you, as a young person, uh, choose a certain number of animals and you uh, you embrace them, you learn as much as you can about them and you defend them uh, the rest of your life. And his uh, totem uh, is a bron bronze winged pigeon. So um, a really interesting idea that I think maybe we should all embrace uh, and adopt. Uh, there is a chapter about Singapore's uh, wonderful story of conservation, bringing back the, the hornbills um, to this city, to the city state. Um, it's a story in part about really creative um, design of these artificial nesting um, boxes, these smart nesting uh, uh, boxes, but in increasingly it's also about the city's move in this direction towards biophilic planning and, and design. And these are two uh, buildings on the left designed by a firm called Woha. And uh, the one in the middle is Oasia downtown. It's a hotel, but it's almost entirely covered with uh, 21 varieties of uh, flowering vines. And as uh, Wang Monsum will uh, say, or has told me, um, admits that you know he designed the building, as he says, for squirrels, not for people. Um, we can, in fact, design buildings like this that create bird habitat, um, add to the habitat that exists in, in, a, in a city. And we have wonderful other examples um, of, the, for example, the KTPH, this very famous uh, green and biophilic hospital in Singapore. Um, and this is a hospital. Um, it's also essentially a, a, a hospital in a, in a park or a hospital in a garden. And the neighbor, neighboring residents come uh, to, to the spaces in and around it. And kids from the neighborhood come to do their homework here. And it has an emphasis on birds. And so their metric for this building was we want a building that will be good for butterflies and birds. And so one wall of one building is a running count of the species of birds um, that they have seen on, on site. So what an interesting way of, uh, an interesting metric, an interesting way of evaluating success um, in, a, in a city. Um, but those spaces have to be, you know, we have to think of all the spaces in a city. And uh, many of those spaces are more suburban, right? And, and there's so many things that we could be doing to convert our uh, sterile, uh, not very bi biodiverse uh, turf grass lawns into bird habitat. And 
Um, this is a, an image of Nina Marie Lister, um, who that's her house on the left, and she has installed um, this native plants garden that, as you see here, this quote of hers, bird song, cricket song. You know, this is what she's giving to the neighborhood um, and the city. Um, actually, not long ago, uh, told her she had to cut it down. So they have uh, something called the Long Grass and Weed Code that actually, like a lot of cities, um, says that you cannot allow anything growing higher than 20 centimeters. In the case of this, this code, that's about eight inches. And so uh, a battle ensued. Um, this is a city that has a biodiversity uh, strategy that wants to uh, be more bird friendly and is and is a, a leading city when it comes to birds but yet um, at the level of um, a, a, a homeowner you're discouraged from from planting this kind of bird habitat that's got to change and it is changing in many places and and it will be changing in um, in, in Toronto as well what else could we do um, there are other culprits in cities of course uh, cats uh, domestic and feral cats um, are a huge uh, risk have a huge impact on on birds. Uh, what can we possibly do about that? Um, one idea discussed in the book is uh, this product called a, a rainbow collar, um, and it's, it's some science behind this that uh, this both the size but the the colors chosen are colors and there's a bell too, uh, but they're colors that birds will will notice and see, and they'll be alerted to the presence of a of of that cat. Um, there are other similar kinds of products. Um, one of the interesting stories that we that I talk about in the book is is, um, is the idea of a catio, and this is a cat patio. And so this is a, a, an innovation um, we we see in Portland. Portland, it's a wonderful partnership between Portland Audubon and the Feral Cats Coalition of Oregon. And so they do this catio tour. Um, every fall, and it's usually 10 homes with catios, and it's 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 like a garden tour. You go, you buy a ticket, and then you go and drive around and visit the the different designs and see how, what people uh, have done. And uh, we made a little film about this as well. That's on the biofluxities.org, uh, but it's a, a wonderful idea. And so this is tough, right? That that often it's a it's a conflict between uh, people who love cats. And people who love birds. And the remarkable part of the story is that these two communities, and they may be the same thing in one person. We, many of us love cats and birds both, uh, but they've come together, these communities, to try to solve um, this problem. So watch the film. There is a film again on the Bible Cities. Um, so um, I, I do make the point that we want to design a biophilic city as a city of awe, a city of awe and wonder. And it ought to be. A place where we, um, you know, we we judge the quality of urban life by the by the by by a city that maximizes maximizes moments of awe, right? And during the course of the day, um, many other many forms of nature provide that awe uh, for us, but birds are especially well suited um, and invoke, at least for me, a lot of awe and and wonder. And this is a. a, a Another story from Portland that that shows this quite well. Um, every night during the month of September, hundreds of people come to the Chapman Elementary School in Portland to watch the roosting of Vox's Swifts. These are Swifts that are migrating through Portland, and they have for a long time stopped at this chimney. And they there's a, a an amazing spectacle of swirling. Um, Swifts, and they, as the sun goes down, they drop in very dramatic fashion into this chimney. I think on the night that we filmed, there might might have been 6,000. Sometimes there are 10,000, and it's a wonderful story, actually, of how the the children in the school raised money to basically uh, install a new a new heating system, so they could they you know they weren't they were worried they had to keep the heat off uh, to protect the birds. And they've reinforced the chimney, so um, it's a, a wonderful uh, story of, of you know, watching this this incredible spectacle. Um, the idea of designing to 
in spaces and cities to not just be safe, not just a, a, a bird safe window that doesn't cause the death or injury of a bird, but rather um, actively in, including spaces that encourage nesting and roosting and make space uh, for, for birds is a big part of what we need to be doing. A lot of stories in the book about this, um, one of them is the Walthamstow Wetlands in London, which is a major bird watching uh, site. And here are the species, one of the species is the common swift. And this is a reconstructed uh, uh, tower. It, uh, um, it, it, doesn't, um, uh, it, it doesn't serve any other function, but it's, this is part of an historic structure. It's a, it's a chimney. The chimney, there was an older chimney there that, that, that was gone, but now they've designed it with 54 cavities um, to allow for uh, swifts to nest. And, and, in, and in the center is, is bat um, habitat. So um, a lot of actually wonderful ideas like this coming out of the UK. And there's a, the, actually the largest home builder, Barrett Homes, has committed to uh, building basically all its develop all of all of its future developments as wildlife friendly uh, developments, and this is actually one called Kingsbrook that I I uh, had the chance to visit and talk about in the book, and uh, these are swift uh, um, bricks actually that are kind of worked into the pattern of bricks as the as the homes are being uh, built. So uh, what's interesting to me is that now some uh, prospective home buyers are actively seeking out these homes because they're because of the swifts. I think that's really really wonderful, and and again emphasizes this this idea of, of cities that we share with other forms of life and talk about having uh, wonder and awe and curiosity and all these things kind of near to where you you live. This is a wonderful example. Okay, I'm coming to the end. Um, I should really uh, go quickly. Other stories, similar kinds of stories, a community called Aldea uh, in New Mexico, where they have a sort of community um, nest box uh, program um, where they're installing uh, nesting nest boxes for uh, the juniper titmouse. It's a community effort, a wonderful story of, again, integrating birds, uh, highlighting birds as part of your neighborhood. And I think we need to be doing more of that. Um, another story from the book is about the uh, burrowing owls of Phoenix and the efforts to, to uh, create artificial underground um, nesting sites. These are five gallon tanks, four feet below the ground, and they are um, uh, built and installed by, uh, by citizens, by volunteers. And it's a wonderful story. We also have about a six minute film about this as well. Here's my um, encouragement to you all to watch this, this film. So we spent the day with one of these volunteer crews as they were improving some of these artificial um, cavities, these nesting sites. And uh, while we were being um, partially scolded by uh, a burrowing owl. And uh, anyway, it's a wonderful story as well of coexistence of how having birds, these wondrous birds uh, that nest underground um, how, how you know, our lives are improved by having them nearby. Um, very coming to the very end, we, there are many things we need to do. Education is a big part of this and educating the next generation of stewards and, and birders and, and bird people who will care about birds. This is Adam uh, Vitell, who is the conservation director for, for uh, Audubon Atlanta. Um, and he visits school, school uh, kids and um, often um, engages them in um, nest nets and actually capturing and banding birds and, and um, incorporating birds into the, into the STEM uh, curriculum, which I think is really important. I do think we need better metrics. So these are images from Wellington, New Zealand, the wonderful story of Zealandia, this wild place in the middle of the city where they've erected predator-proof fences to allow the, the native species of birds to rebound with wonderful success, and the kaka, uh, this native parrot, is now seen uh, in, in neighborhoods around the city, but their tagline is bringing birdsong back to Wellington. So we might, again, judge the, the, the success, the efficacy of our planning 
um, by you know whether you can hear uh, bird song, and every neighborhood and every city should be able to hear uh, native bird song. So it's also about again returning wonder and curiosity. This is my last image, which is we have uh, started to do these um, bird watching walks through the grounds of UVA, and uh, it is uh, part partly the challenge I think is to reimagine the spaces around us as as habitats and as um, spaces that again are inhabited by lots of other forms of life and we may not see that walk to class or that that um, set of buildings on a campus as bird habitat but it, it very much uh, is so um, I should not forget to do this here is the book and uh, thanks to Island Press there is this um, bit of discount um, and would, would love for you all to to uh, buy it, spread the word, and um, hopefully we'll see um, more and more bird-friendly cities and many, many more biophilic cities. So I believe that is it. There are other Island Press books. There's one about biophilic cities and there's a handbook, a handbook of biophilic city planning and design, less about birds, more about the first part of the presentation. And um, um, and I think that's it. Here's the web page, biophilicities.org. So thanks so much for, for listening, and uh, sorry to have gone so fast um, through this, but uh, look forward to any questions you might have. Great. Thank you very much, Tim. And actually, we'll ask you to turn your uh, webcam on if you can now as we get into the question oh, yeah, and answer yeah, session. That's okay. I didn't realize it was no. Nope. So, yeah. That's good. No, we, we don't usually have to meet. The presentation part. Um, so thanks okay. for uh, the presentation and thanks for everybody who has really flooded us with questions um, throughout your presentation and you can continue to uh, ask them through the questions tab. So I um, yeah. just wanted to uh, start with this one if you're ready. Um, okay. So how do we convince other city departments to get on board, board with implementing um, bird-friendly and biophilic design strategies. I work for a municipality and get a lot of pushback, particularly from operations and maintenance on bird-friendly plantings in the public realm. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, there are a lot of different ways of arguing for um, these biophilic elements in your city. Um, I mean, we have, we have studies that show um, you know, workers are more productive in offices, um, schools, test scores are higher, you know, when you have nature around, crime rates go down. Um, Bill Browning and his group uh, have done um, kind of back of the envelope calculations of, you know, when you start to add all of the, the economic value of these elements of nature, it's pretty significant, right? And, and um, the benefits more than outweigh the costs. Um, so I can appreciate that uh, certain people with certain jobs are are maybe not going to want to you know deal with maintenance, and we need certainly need to think about that. But if you're arguing for these things to the city council or a mayor, the economic um, and social benefits are are tremendous, and the ecosystem service services provided by all these things and and, and you know, if we're going to, uh, we need to move quickly to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but we could stop today and we're still going to need to be adapting to things like urban heat. And that will mean, and, and stormwater, we're still going to, you know, we're going to need to plant more trees and we're going to need more uh, living walls and green rooftops and, and all the things, all those things that could be um, bird friendly, elements of a, of a bird friendly uh, city as well. So that's one answer is emphasize the power the, of all those those benefits that we're we're getting. Um, and you know many of the stories that I told in the first part of the slideshow were things uh, like the street park in San Francisco and the 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 maintenance, the upkeep, the um, stewarding over that that space is something the neighborhood takes on. That has to be a that's sort of a condition for for establishing a, a street park. And so I think to the extent that we you know can can actively engage 
uh, neighbors and neighborhoods and, and, and organizations and, and the upkeep and management of these, these uh, spaces, so much the better. But, so that's at least a partial answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's another question from Joseph Chambers who asked, uh, where does the 30% canopy cover metric come from? And what is the metric? Why is it not like 40% or 20%? 30% canopy cover. Um, I'm not sure I, I, I said that, but um, I think there are some, some numbers, some guidelines that, that organizations like uh, American Forests have put out. And you know, for a long time, it was 35%. There's nothing magic about that. I did show the image of Pittsburgh. This may be what the person's thinking about. Um, their canopy is 42%. Atlanta is almost 50%, um, so we can go higher, um, and you know, may, uh, and we're going to have to kind of increasingly think about projects like the Designer Designers Walk in Toronto. They will tell you there that their climate change uh, plan that calls for planting more trees. Well, they've planted a, a lot of trees, and and so it may be that you know uh, uh, some of those trees are going to have to be in in vertical buildings. Um, and so, and so there's nothing magic about about 30%, but I'm not quite sure where that, um, what what slide or what a, what standard that. Oh, I know now. Of course, it was Richmond, and um, that actually uh, that was a stand that was a minimum standard for all neighborhoods as a as a response to the equity a concern. So there's some neighborhoods that are, you know, the, the affluent white neighborhoods that are really leafy, um, but then neighborhoods of color that are, you know, 10% or 9% or 12%, if, if that. Um, so the idea that every neighborhood needs to be brought up to at least uh, 30%, and actually the, the target in the Richmond 300 plan for the city canopy overall is 60%, I think. Um, so I, I'm not Sure, the thirty percent it was a sort of um, a, a practical threshold, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question here is from Eileen Fielding, who says, "I love the concept. Is there any analysis of the cost of maintaining the plants in biophilic buildings? What about long-term wear and tear on structural materials caused by plants, bird dropping, soil accumulations, etc.? Just trying to anticipate some of the objectives." Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing again. To, one thing to say, and I'm I'm an advocate of uh, all of these things. You can tell um, it is that we want to make sure we understand again the benefits. And so, with green, with the installation of green rooftops and and uh, rooftop meadows. So we, we're going through this. You know, I think really positive uh, transformation from just seeing a green roof as um, a, a place for uh, sedums and th things that may not be very native to, to imagining that roof as a native meadow, right? A, a, a meadow that's uh, with a lot of native uh, plants that, that would be bird um, ha habitat. Um, and I mean, what we know, what we've discovered about green rooftops is that they, um, and I'm talking about extensive green roofs that you know are, are relatively shallow, covering the entire uh, uh, roof, and they um, ha they serve to protect, uh, in fact, and and extend the longevity of the underlying roof system, and so they actually pay for themselves pretty pretty well, um, and so um, that's from the perspective of a private building owner, um, that's an argument that would that would carry. The day, um, and I think the the but I think but you're absolutely right when you talk about landscape management and park management. Um, what what does this agenda suggest about the additional uh, human power and cost that it might take? Um, and really interesting story from Singapore, which is that during their their two month uh, lockdown. What they called their circuit breaker, um, where the national parks, in parks, national parks board uh, staff couldn't the usual they couldn't do their usual manicured you know trimming and landscaping of the of the green spaces, and so they went a little bit wild. Um, and what 
they discovered was that there were more there were more butterflies and and birds and people were you know residents were kind of uh, warming up to the to the wild the greater wildness that they saw. Um, now you still have to you know pay attention to you have to have those cues of care that show that this is not something that's abandoned but we're, this is an intentional thing. Um, but I, I think one answer is we need to be creative about how uh, we can create you know the no no mo zones or places that where we let like that that lawn that space formerly lawn space around um, you know Marie Lister's uh, house that I showed an example of that that those will be self-maintaining right that that's the ideal um, they will they will provide all of these fantastic benefits for us uh, collective benefits uh, but they will require a lot less uh, maintenance and upkeep so that's one another answer from an advocate you know who's who's um, uh, tr trying to convince cities to do these these kind of things that was a long answer that's, right now that's okay that's okay um, so during your presentation we got a couple of uh, questions in this vein so I'll read this okay. one to you I'm interested in the challenges of urban vermin. What are some experiences handling pigeons, roaches, and rats, and how can we have a manageable symbiosis with nature and hopefully minimize these vermin? And another person said, people worry about attracting rats when natural spaces are created in cities. How can we address this? Uh, that topic um, yeah, well, that's interesting. I'm not sure I have a, a, a terrific example, but I mean, I think that, in, in terms of rats and, and stuff that maybe people don't want to see as much of, it's it's almost more, it's less about the creation of green space and uh, parks and, and green you know elements. It's probably more about waste management and more about garbage management. And uh, we, we may need to do a better job. We probably do uh, on those kind, kinds of things. Um, the mention of pigeons is interesting because you know we we do understand that or we do envision that the urban ecosystem is an is an ecosystem and there are symbiotic uh, relationships and sometimes new emerging ones. So with the return of things like peregrine falcons, we have a hu hugely you know successful story of bringing peregrine back, uh, falcons back partly because of you know banning DDT but but uh, pigeons are a food source right um, and so that's one thing is is sort of doing what we can to imagine um, you know a more balanced uh, ecosystem in a city where you know, where um, pigeons might be partially controlled in a sense populations by by um, uh, predators like a like a peregrine falcon. Okay, thank you. Um, next uh, question is from Monica Berger, who said, "Short of convincing our whole city to become biophilic, how can we make our immediate surroundings more bird friendly?" Yeah, um, so many things that you you could do at an individual level. Um, at a at the level of a of a homeowner, um, I showed again the that native plants yard um, in the in the book. There's quite a bit of discussion about the um, um, certified backyard uh, wildlife habitat program that that uh, Portland Audubon runs. It's really wonderful and 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 one of the the largest and they exist in other other cities, other uh, other Audubon groups uh, run them, and National Wildlife Federation has a version. Um, this I really like the Portland one. It's uh, rigorous and it's uh, continuous. Um, and as a home homeowner, you know you're challenged to to uh, continue to plant more things and to that. That's one answer. It, it is and I uh, highly recommend um, the work of Doug Tallamy. Uh, University of Delaware uh, e ecologist and his and his books, um, and he has this idea that I love of, of rethinking the turf grass lawns 
uh, you know, as a kind of homegrown national park, as he as he likes to call it. So, you know, that if you add it all up, 40 million acres or something, as he suggests, if you if we just took half your lawn, if we took, you know, if each of us uh, devoted half our lawn to bird friendly planting, native species of plants and trees, um, that would create, you know, a, a huge 20 million acre park system, essentially the largest national park, as he said. So there's so many things you could do at, at that level. Um, FLAP in, in Toronto has some wonderful guides about how you can make your home, you know, more bird friendly. If we're talking just, we're talking about birds and that means things like the paracords, bird friendly glass, um, you know, being conscious about that, things you can do, keep keeping your pet, keeping your cat inside, especially during nesting season. There's so many things that you could do at that level um, then lots of things you could do at a, at a sort of neighborhood level or a, a district level. Um, and, and those are things like a community garden or a uh, uh, effort to plant trees, um, you know, ways that you can begin to um, organize those examples of my bird walk um, and kind of activate the neighborhood around the, the, the wildlife and the species that you, you see and, and would like to see. So there, there are a lot of things that, you, that could happen um, in, in that way. Um, but then that hopefully will lead you to become more active and involved at the city level, right? So we really need advocates um, to come forward and say to their elected representatives, we want to, we want to, we want to live in a biophilic city. We don't just want, you know, it's great that um, I might have more nature around my house, but uh, we, we need it throughout the city and we need to really reimagine the city itself as a, as a place of nature, as an ecosystem. It's interesting that you mentioned Doug Callum because a couple of our referenced him as well okay um <laughs> big fan everybody's on that same page with him um next question here is what can we do as regulators to support bird friendly policy yeah yeah that's a great a great question and i somehow i managed not to to talk at all about that did i i mean i kind of alluded to it um toronto um has their their green standard um they they were the first city in North America to mandate um, bird-friendly design uh, standards. Um, and um, thinking about American cities, San Francisco is the first American city to do that. I highly recommend that you look at their bird safe design requirements. Um, and, and so New York City has adopted uh, um, some that, that, that are coming into effect, I think, uh, maybe January 1st of the year, um, that will be have a huge impact. So again, instead of uh, having one or two buildings, um, the Javits Center was wonderful, that retrofit, um, or, or the Frick Center, many of the examples, having a code uh, that, that mandates um, that every, every new building or every substantially renovated structure has to have um, bird safe uh, windows and bird, bird safe um, uh, facades, uh, you know, it, it scales up in a, in a really, you know, in, impactful way. And we need to be doing um, more of that. I'd, I'd love for every city to, to uh, take, you know, some version of this and, and, and apply it and, 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 um, uh, and adopt it. So San Francisco, Chicago is working on a similar ordinance. Uh, these are all sort of talked about in the book. Um, we, we have proposed legislation in the US Congress um, to uh, create a mandate um, for federal buildings uh, that passed uh, the House. Uh, we'll see what happens with the Senate. Um, so codes, uh, regulations, ordinances are really important for ramping up and scaling up a lot of these uh, things that we've been talking about. Okay, thanks, Tim. Uh, next question here is from uh, Jay Lambrex is asking, um, can you talk about combining bio design with transportation network design and implementation? Hmm. 
Okay. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So, um, I mean, there's some, there are so many ways, right? I mean, one of the things I said about a bifolk city is a city that gets us outside. And so many of the best examples, uh, Copenhagen, you know, has a green, uh, uh, green routes, a site green cycle routes program. Uh, so if you want to ride your bicycle to work, but you don't necessarily want to be in, in, uh, heavy, heavy traffic. Um, these are routes that will take you through a park or alongside a park. And it's a wonderful example of how uh, bicycle planning and uh, planning for nature uh, come, come together. And the same is true for almost anything that we do to get people walking, right? Um, slow streets or um, the park connectors, I, connector idea from Singapore is, a, is partly a transportation, partly a mobility uh, solution. And, and similarly with public transit, I mean, we have some of our best uh, biophilic natureful cities. Oslo, for example, has this uh, huge uh, public forest and uh, uh, at least one metro station entirely uh, designed and built to get people to that forest. <clears throat> Such an important part of the culture there. So these things can go together uh, and, and definitely should. <clears throat> Um, we have a, a colleague in Australia who has been uh, actively helping to design biophilic um, public transit stations. Um, as the this is in Melbourne, the Melbourne expansion of the Melbourne Metro. Um, so we could be incorporating biophilic design principles into every uh, thing that we do. Uh, we've gotten to know there's a designer and a Spanish designer who's who's designed these green rooftops for buses. Um, which is really interesting, a guy named Mark Granyan. Um, that's, um, you know, kind of an interesting way of thinking about mobile, mobile nature, that nature, that, that, that riding that bus actually can, can you know, you're, uh, can, can foster some new, uh, some new nature in the city. So there, there are lots of ways. I think that's, um, that's a really good thought. Great, thanks, Tim. Do you mind if we go over a few minutes? Because we do have many, many questions here. Yeah, that's great. That's fine with me. And and by the way, if anybody would like to send me uh, a message, it's it's beatly at virginia.edu. We'd love for you to join the network as an individual. And again, if you are involved in any city that you think would like to join, would love to hear from folks off offline if that's uh, uh, if you'd like to send me an email. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question here is from Paul Donegan, who asks, what recommendations do you have for tailoring biophilic programs and regulations for more arid climates? Are there good examples besides partner city Phoenix? We hear a lot of pushback <laughs> on ideas like green walls, water features, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, so far, to think about this, um, we, you know, Phoenix is in, in the network now. And so um, that does tend to be the place where we get a lot of inspiration. I have to give a lot of credit to the city of Phoenix for how it has a decade or so. Um, and the percentage of lawns, for example, in, in sort of, you know, uh, water, water intensive, non-native, uh, grasses has it, it's shifted pretty dramatically in in the direction of xeriscaping and drought tolerant native native species and um, to their credit um, if you walk around downtown Phoenix there's a lot of a lot of landscaping public landscaping that uh, in, incorporates um, native plants and you know it's their mesquites and and cacti and things that are that are incredibly beautiful and natureful and uh, but but yet make a lot more sense for that for that climate. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, green rooftops don't make as much sense in a place like um, like Phoenix. So if you're interested, um, that we have had um, a group in Phoenix that has worked on some arid climate biophilic design. Uh, standards, um, and I'm happy to, to share some of that with with you. Um, and it, it it does suggest, and I, I did give the example of the um, the burrowing owls in, in Phoenix, and and it's uh, part of the Salt River 
um, story of of how a lot of things, of course, have to involve around have, have to involve water in some way or rethinking of of uh, of, of water. Um, but what we what we'd like to do actually is have a a kind of a subgroup within the biophilic cities network of arid cities. Um, Fremantle and Western Australia actually fits a little bit that 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 category, and so they have some really interesting stories of, again of, about how how to how to manage verges and and landscaping that that's kind of more Mediterranean than than, than the um, kind of uh, green lush um, landscaping that you find in many in many of our cities. I'll have to do some more thinking of, about examples that I can share though. Okay. The uh, next question here is, how hard is it to maintain a bird-friendly environment in a neighborhood common area? Yeah, so um, Alde, I guess I, I gave the example from, um, from Santa Fe. And um, it's a good question. And I, I, I can Im imagine some problems. I mean, these are in the American um, legal framework where you own your home and a portion of, of the common space and there's a homeowners association. I, you know, I can imagine, I don't know offhand of stories of obstacles or difficulties uh, that a homeowners association might, you know, be resistant to having um, like the juni juniper tip bo mouse boxes or more birds. I can't imagine that, frankly, but some of the things um, uh, fountains and 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 again native vegetation i could imagine there might be some opposing voices but it's hard hard to imagine it i mean i, I think wherever you have more birds um at least from my perspective life is more interesting and um and a diversity of birds and native and native species of birds for the most part and and um and again, bird song goes with that. Um, so I'm not sure I have any great stories or, or great cautionary tales about that. I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear from any of you all that might have had a, an experience, a cautionary tale. Um, I, I do uh, acknowledge that there are, this is one of the, generally the, one of the challenges we have with the vision of biophilic cities. Not everybody, um, appreciates more nature that we we believe it is an innate aff affiliation and innate thing it's we're hardwired but for a lot of us um we haven't exercised that biophilic muscle we haven't thought or learned about the nature around us we haven't um paid enough attention perhaps um and so it, it, it there's a fear about nature or, or at least an undervaluing of, of nature whether it's birds or or anything else that so there's an obstacle there that that we just generally have to overcome okay um, next question here is uh, how can we move beyond having to make the economic argument for nature-centric plants do you have any thoughts on this yeah um, I do believe that and I, I usually don't start with the economic argument. I'm not sure why I did today, but in response to that, one of those first questions, but um, I am more often pointing to the, the sort of way, ways in which connections to nature make for a more meaningful life. And uh, that, that to me is, is really the stronger uh, argument that um, we can, do many things, and that's part, partly why I object a little bit sometimes to the language. The language we choose. Sometimes we're talking about nature-based solutions or green infrastructure, um, and and those are okay. But the idea that nature, we want nature because of these the services provided or the uh, e economic value of the services provided. Um, biophilia and biophilic. Um, are better words for me because they emphasize love, the love of nature. The, the philia is as important as the bio. 
And I think that one answer or one response is for more of us to be standing up and talking that way and saying, I, I want to live a deeply uh, connected, nature connected life. I want to live a meaningful life um, in kinship or in, in a connection with many other forms of life. And that's, um, we've, we've co-evolved with birds and other life forms. And that's, um, that's a truly human um, instinct, a truly human biophilia. So uh, it, you know, that, that's kind of where I, I don't, I don't know that that's going to resonate with everybody. Um, but I, I do think increasingly there is a recognition and again, a, a silver lining from the pandemic of, of just really how central nature is to our existence, to our lives, to our, 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 our sense of well-being and um, ha having that, that sense of normalcy, that, that sense of something being part of a, something really larger than ourselves. Um, and, and the birds are still singing and still migrating and, and it makes us feel better to, to know that and, and to, I, I think those, are, those arguments will maybe increasingly carry the day um, I'd love to know what the what the what you think the, the the person who posed that question. That's the problem with this this one direction, right? We can't really have a discussion um, with questions and answers. It's a great That's question, not, though. Not not quite a dialogue, but thanks for taking the question. Not quite. No, I guess <laughs> it's a little bit cumbersome for that, but yeah. Sure. And we also are limited by time and the, and the amount of questions we get at. So we'll just ask a couple more right. and then I'll have you up. Uh, okay. Here's one, uh, I'd, I'd love, which is. By the way, a, a record of the questions. We're going we're gonna to save the questions, hopefully. Yes, we can go okay. ahead and share them all, with, including okay. the That'd folks who uh, asked them. And you will also get a list of the people who attended today. Um, so here's the one. Uh, there's a trend of maximizing building footprints on residential property. While we may be able to change maximum footprints in the code, how can we move residents to want to have smaller homes and larger yards? Huh. Okay, uh, smaller homes and larger yards. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I would worry slightly about that just because, you know, part of our vision of biophilic cities, even though I've been talking a lot about lawns, is about denser, compact urban form, and so I like the idea of smaller, uh, smaller homes, um, but I'm I'm not sure that we should be spreading out, um, and 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 with relatively larger yards. Um, I would r rather that we we you know densify and and cluster, and uh, do do a really good job protecting and conserving that land at the edge of the city or um, that river basin or that ravine or um, that that might be uh, larger and more connected because our our urban or suburban footprint is smaller um, uh, but definitely smaller smaller homes um, make a lot of sense for a lot of reasons right and anything we can do to, to We've got we we still have a huge challenge to, in creating more affordable housing, and um, changing our zoning codes to you know to to lower the minimums, and do do whatever we can to create you know flexibility. Uh, makes makes certainly makes sense. Great, thanks. I guess we'll have one last question here. Um, can university campuses become a part of this organization, and how might their metrics differ? Yes, um, it's a great question. We don't. We've had that come up a couple of times. Um, it's definitely true. Of talking about the UVA the grounds and our bird walking, uh, our bird walks. Uh, definitely, the the case that campuses are little cities, right? Um, and um, right now, we don't have a a mechanism 
for a campus to join as a partner city because they're not really cities. Um, but there are would be a lot of other ways to be part of the network, and and one would be to just join as a as a kind of organization. Um, and and so we we should it's a it's a great question. We should uh, we should develop a, a, a category or some some joining a joining protocol that would that would uh, facilitate that and, and and make it clear that if you're a university, um, you you could be you could join. There are you know other other networks and other organizations uh, that are focused on on networks of cam of campuses um, around nature. There's a group based at Cornell that has been uh, um, promoting the idea of uh, nature prescriptions, and it's a Park, Parks RX network, and they have a, their network is a, is is essentially campuses, um, and the idea of of incorporating nature as something that you would would be in, encouraged to enjoy or or seek out as as part of the student health service for for example that's uh and um, that's really promising we have a lot of cities of course where there's some form of of uh, parks rx or uh the idea of you know prescriptions for park visits or um, nature walks but that's a good a good example a good uh, idea and we'll have to i'll have to think some more about universities and campuses Okay, thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. And unlike some of the topic, there's quite a range of questions here today uh, that we to share with you. So just uh, that's great. In close, wondering if you have some um, thoughts for us that we can kind of take away from your presentation today. Well, um, I, the main theme I think is that we we need uh, nature um, more than ever before, right? I mean, in this um, in, at, in times of stress, especially, um, and nature does so many things for us. I'll circle back to what I said in the beginning. It's uh, not something optional. It's absolutely essential to, to leading a happy, healthy, meaningful life. And so everything that we do in cities should start with nature. And, um, and birds are a big part of where we should start. And um, that's the second message you know that every city can and should aspire to be uh deeply bird friendly and that's what the the book is about and and uh we we have a we're duty bound i i believe um uh recognizing the in, inherent worth the intrinsic value of of birds but also um they are our kin and our friends and our and and they make us happy and uh, for so for all those reasons, we need to be paying more attention um, to to them uh, where we live in cities. Great. Well, thank you so much, Tim, for being with us today. Uh, with that, we're going to conclude our webinar, um, which was bird, the bird friendly and biophilic city integrating safe natural habitats into urban design and planning. I'd like to offer a great big thank you to Tim Beatley for a great presentation everyone who attended today, and to John Coleman, our communications and technology guru, who helps to make this, make this all happen. The complete, the complete recording of today's webinar will be posted on smartgrowth.org. Also, for those of you who have requested one, all attendees will receive an email that will contain a link um, to a personalized certificate of participation. Please look for this follow-up email. When you exit from today's webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a short evaluation. Please take a few moments to provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the webinar experience for you. And keep an eye on smartgrowth.org and your email inbox for details on other future webinars, including Blueprint for Greening Affordable Housing with Kim Burley Vermeer and Walker Wells, which will be next Thursday, November 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Have a great day.